Hello, my friends. Welcome to Origins. We're so glad you've joined us. My name's Don Chapman, and it's my delight to be your host. You know, Origins is a forum where we use the evidence of science to validate the truth of creation. And we have one of my very favorite guests with us today. Dr. David Menton is with us. Dr. Menton, how good it is to have you here. Thank you, Don. It's great to be here. Now, we're not going to look under a microscope today, are we? <laughs> not at all. We're going to talk about something that... Uh, really needs to be talked about in the Christian community and as much as we can outside the Christian community we need to talk about the Scopes monkey trial to use the vernacular term. Bring us up to date on why this is so significant. Well you know many people agree that the Scopes monkey trial or just the Scopes trial is the most famous trial ever in America and uh, yet today a lot of people uh, aren't aware that it ever happened but it's a trial that took place back in July of 1925, a very hot July, in the little town of Dayton, Tennessee. And that trial pitted two very famous lawyers uh, against one another, uh, dealing with the whole issue of creation and evolution, uh, particularly what should be taught in the classroom to students. And can we look back at that trial as sort of a paradigm shift in American education where before then, creation was sort of the the standard and evolution was kind of nipping at its heels but after that evolution became the standard was it, that be a true statement yeah absolutely uh, back then the evolutionists were saying let us in the door too yeah. you know we have something to say and then once the evolutionists got in the door of course creation was out and then the tables were turned all right we've got to deal not only with history we also have to deal with art don't we that's right because sadly a lot of what we think we know about the Scopes trial comes from art, comes particularly from plays and theater. Very, very famous play called Inherit the Wind. Uh, show you a picture of it here. Uh, Inherit the Wind was a play that was written back in 1955. And uh, a movie based in that play in 1960, also called Inherit the Wind, very much like the play, has become basically what people think they know about the Scopes trial. And of course, in 1960, Spencer Tracy was probably the most prominent actor in the United States. Yes, uh, uh, Frederick March uh, and Spencer Tracy, and they sort of reenacted this uh, famous trial, the Scopes trial. Uh, sadly, as I say, it's what people think happened at the trial. And the basic gist is that a high school teacher teaching biology, minding his own business, uh, taught evolution and vicious town folk from the little town of Dayton, Tennessee, which includes a local fundamentalist preacher. Those bigoted Christians, oh, yes. yes. And uh, politicians, yeah. they came into the classroom and just collared poor John Scopes, pulled him right out of there in front of his students, put him in jail. The local town people showed up threatening to lynch him, and he was just thoroughly hated, and the whole thing, of course, was supposed to be a witch hunt. Now, we're still showing this. I mean, we show it in science class, we show it in English class, we do it for the school play, and no one ever says, this is fable, this isn't the truth, do they? No, and that's sad, and it's the kind of thing I think, uh, if I were to change the educational system of America, one of the first things I would do is try to get teachers and students to be more critical yes. of what they read and what they see. Let's just uh, take a look at some of the real history of the Scopes trial. Instead of looking at Inherit the Wind there, uh, we'll look at some of the... Uh, uh, authors that have written about the Scopes trial in an objective way and especially we'll look at the transcript of the Scopes trial itself. And, and that's a really important point. This is not your opinion but this is a because it was a trial and there was a stenographer we know exactly what was said and exactly what happened. Absolutely. The book that gives the entire transcript of the trial is available to this day and can be purchased. It's called The World's Most Famous Court Trial. One of my favorite books about the, the trial, unfortunately out of print now, uh, is The Great Monkey Trial by Sprague de Camp. We kind of took the name of this program from that book. And uh, Sprague de Camp was hardly a champion of William Jennings Bryan, who was the Christian lawyer that uh, prosecuted uh, uh, the teacher scopes. And he said that the trial wasn't a witch hunt, as it's been called, because the accused and his defenders, which you would normally call the witches, were actually the hunters stalking the law with the intent of overturning it, or at least making it unenforceable. So this isn't about people in town going after John Scopes. This is about using John Scopes to change a law. Absolutely. Okay. You may be interested in just exactly uh, who law? was behind it then. Yeah. If it wasn't the people of Dayton, Tennessee, 
Well, you may have heard of these folks before. <laughs> yeah, the American Civil Liberties Union. Back in the 1920s, there were 36 states in America that had enacted bills that uh, would have made it illegal to teach the evolution of man. Uh, the bill in question is known as the Butler Act. He was a representative in the state legislature, and this is the way the important part of it read. It shall be unlawful for any teacher in any of the universities, normals, and all other public schools of the state, which are supported in whole or in part by public school funds of the state, to teach any theory that denies the story of divine creation of man as taught in the Bible, and to teach instead that man is descended from a lower order of animals. So basically the teaching of the evolution of man was illegal in most public schools, at least in 34 states. That's right, with this bill. You could teach that life evolved from non-life, you right. could teach that vertebrates came from invertebrates, uh, you could teach uh, the origin of dinosaurs, you could teach anything you wanted. But they wanted to hold man high and dry. And you couldn't teach that. Sanctity of human life issue. That's right. Okay. So uh, the ACLU obviously did not like this. Sure. And they wanted to make this bill unenforceable. And if they could do it in Tennessee, of course, it would apply to all the other states that had passed essentially the, the so, same bill. So again, this is about, there's a roadblock to manipulating and changing our culture from a Christian culture that believes the Bible to a non-Christian culture that doesn't believe the Bible. This is back in 1925. And this was the roadblock to the cultural shift they wanted to make. That's right. And okay. this was a huge turning point. That's Our right. schools changed dramatically after this. Right. And, and, and this is why I think people need to know. That's right. Need to know about very this important You'll see the issues are basically the same, haven't changed much. Well, let's look at the teacher himself. This is John Scopes. Uh, John Scopes was a teacher in Dayton, Tennessee, beautiful little town uh, in the Cumberland Mountains. Uh, you can still visit it today and see the courthouse where this trial was uh, fought. And uh, John Scopes, uh, back in July of 1925, is shown here with his father. That's at the time of the trial. And uh, some interesting facts about John Scopes. He had graduated in pre-law from the University of Kentucky. So the first thing you can see is he was not a science teacher. Okay, he had no science background at this time. Right. You're probably beginning to wonder how on earth did this teacher get involved with the Civil Liberties Union in testing the evolution teaching. Well, he taught one year out of his entire life, and that one year was in the Ray County School District of Dayton, Tennessee, and there he taught math and coached the football team. And uh, the movie and the play portrays uh, the people of Dayton as just hating John Scopes for teaching evolution. As you'll see, he never taught evolution. In fact, he was quite popular. And I'll leave uh, our audience here to guess whether he was popular because he was such a good math teacher or because the football team did pretty well under John Scopes that year. <laughs> now, this is how he got involved. It's a mystery why somebody like this would have ever gotten involved with the ACLU to test this law in the courts, but he filled in for a sick biology teacher, a certain Mr. Ferguson, for the last two weeks of the school year. So Mr. Ferguson, who teaches biology, gets sick, and John Scopes goes in basically like a study hall to keep the kids in line while they study the last two weeks for their Substitute final. Substitute teacher. So how did a teacher with that kind of a background get involved in this case? Uh, the first thing you need to know is that John Scopes never taught evolution. As far as I know, he never taught evolution in his life. Uh, there was a conversation recorded back at the time of the trial between Scopes and a certain William K. Hutchison of the International News Service. And Scopes says, there's something I must tell you. It's worried me. I didn't violate the law. I never taught that evolution lesson. Don, when was the last time you worried about not violating a law? <laughs> yeah. Now, is, is this, this during the trial or after the trial? This was during the trial. In fact, uh, they wanted to publish this, but he said, oh, my goodness, don't, don't publish it now. Wait till the trial's over. If people find out I never even taught evolution, uh, I'll become the laughing stock of the whole world. That's incredible. Notice what he said. He says, those kids they put on the stand couldn't remember what I taught them three months ago. I think any teacher watching the program will understand this. Couldn't remember what I taught them three months ago. They were coached by the lawyers. Now, isn't there a name for lawyers coaching 
defendants to say things that they know is untrue. I believe that would be perjury. Yes, that would be the name for it. Now, you're going to want to know how on earth did he get roped into this. Yes. And he did get roped into it. And I think there's a lesson here. Be careful who your friends are, because your friends can sometimes get you into trouble. During the year that John spent in Dayton, he had a friend about his age by the name of George Replaya. George Replaya was an interesting fellow. He married uh, into a family that owned a big mine in Dayton. You can see a notch in the mountains to this day when you drive through Dayton where they were digging for ore. Uh, that was the Cumberland Iron and Coal Mine. And he wanted to get investments to get the ore down to the river and what have you. And of course, most people never heard of the little town of Dayton. We're not talking Dayton, Ohio now. We're talking Dayton, Tennessee. Dayton, Tennessee. And he thought if he could promote this famous trial in Dayton, you get a lot of attention on the town and get some investments. <laughs> and uh, so he was the one that talked his friend, John Scopes, into cooperating in the American Civil Liberties Union's test case. And how did he do that? Well, first of all, he found out about the uh, test case uh, when he visited Chattanooga, which is not far from Dayton. And there he read the Daily Times, Chattanooga Daily Times, and the ACLU advertised, and that advertisement said, among other things, we're looking for a Tennessee teacher who is willing to accept our services in testing this law in the courts. So let's just stop there because we need to make sure we're bringing everybody with us. Not only did the townsfolks not mob and try to lynch Scopes, Scopes got involved in this by answering an ad from the ACLU because they wanted a test case. The whole initiator of this is not bigoted Christians in Dayton, Tennessee. That's right. It's liberal ACLU trying to impose their culture on us. And by the way, it's not the ACLU in Dayton, Tennessee either. It's the American Civil Liberties Union out of New York City that initiated okay. all of this. Well, Replaya sent a telegram to the American Civil Liberties Union saying as follows, Professor J.T. Scopes, I like that touch. He's a professor. Teacher of science, what do you figure? We've got two lies already and we're not even through the first sentence. <laughs> in Ray County High School of Dayton, Tennessee, will be arrested and charged with teaching evolution if they get the consent of the superintendent of education for the test case to be defended by you, that is the ACLU. Wire me collect if you wish to cooperate and arrest will follow. In other words, they're not going to arrest this guy unless the ACLU takes him on. So the only reason for the arrest is to help the ACLU propagate their, their theory. That's right. So what they did is they went right out to a local lawyer, Sue Hicks. Sue Hicks was a lawyer in the Dayton law firm of Hicks and Hicks. He, he worked with his father there. Of course, that wouldn't necessarily make him world famous. He was the man that prepared the arrest warrant for John Scopes. He uh, uh, was also the man who uh, went out and then arrested him. And he was immediately released in a $1,000 bond. John Scopes never spent a day of his life in jail, unlike the movie and the play suggest. And never spent $1,000. That money no, would come that from New York, too. No, that money was all yes. provided. Yeah. And then, of course, another great decision on his part is he's the one that asked William Jennings Bryan to serve as prosecution. And that was guaranteed to get publicity for this trial. Well, he was invited, uh, John Scopes, that is, to go to New York City and, and talk to the American Civil Liberties Union. Uh, but here he is in Robinson's Drugstore. And this is where all the plans were hatched in this the little in town. downtown of, Dayton. Downtown Dayton, Tennessee. You see him sitting there looking at a book at an ice cream table. And that book is not just any book. That book is Hunter's Civic Biology. And they decided that even though John Scopes wasn't the biology teacher, he only filled in for two weeks, the fact is in the biology class they used this book and this book taught that man evolved from ape-like creatures, and that's as close as he got to teaching evolution. Now, we have a copy of that book here with us, don't we? Absolutely. A and by copy, I don't mean one that's been reproduced. This is a copyright 1914 edition a Civic Biology by George W. Hunter. And uh, we have to take a break, and when we come back, Dr. Menton is going to open up this Civic Biology book, and he's going to show us what was taught as biology back then and how that led to the Scopes trial. You don't want to miss this. Stay with us. Today's guest on Origins, anatomist Dr. David Menton, 
is a speaker for Answers in Genesis. Audiences enjoy his well-illustrated presentations on a variety of fascinating topics. Many of these lectures are available on DVD. If you're interested in the subject of creation, you'll definitely want these for your own. Orders are being taken at 800-778-3390. You can also write to Answers in Genesis, P.O. Box 510, Hebron, Kentucky, 41048. Or visit the website at www.answersingenesis.org. We're back with Dr. Menton talking about the Scopes trial. Now, Dr. Menton, you have a copy here of Hunter's Civic Biology. Uh, was this a great uh, biology book? <laughs> I don't think I'd want to use it today. You know, the picture you see on the screen up here, that uh, book there is the very book that we have right here. And you may be interested in what passed for science and what the American Civil Liberties Union was defending and what the World Council of Churches was defending back at this time. Let's just look at one statement in this book right here under the chapter called The Races of Men. This is what it says in part, and I quote, if we follow the early history of man upon the earth, we find that at first he must have been little better than one of the lower animals. So that was where it violates the uh, Butler Act right there. It goes on to say, at the present time, there exist upon the earth five races or varieties of men. And then after a listing, it says, the highest type of all, the Caucasians, represented by the civilized white inhabitants of Europe and America. Evolution didn't exactly begin or initiate racism. That was already well underway and sadly even in the church. But it said it put racism on a scientific footing. So it had a legitimacy it didn't have before. Now I hasten to add, I'm not implying that all evolutionists will necessarily be racist. The evolutionists I know personally most assuredly are not. What I am saying is that uh, racism is consistent yes. with evolutionism. Well, let's move on. Let's uh, John the Scopes then uh, took a trip to New York City. I suspect he had never been to the big city before, and this picture shows him at the headquarters of the American Civil Liberties Union in New York City. And uh, on the left over here is uh, uh, the fellow that is going to be of interest to us. Uh, that's Clarence Darrow. He was a very, very famous uh, criminal lawyer. Uh, some say the most famous and most successful criminal lawyer ever in the history of America. Next to him are two other individuals who played a, a very important part in the trial, Dudley Field Malone and uh, John Randolph Neal. And here is John Scopes right in the middle getting his instructions so that uh, he knows what to do <laughs> his in the court of case. Fame. That's right. Well, the day of the trial, it was in July, it was 1925, the temperatures were in the upper 90s, and this is back when a air conditioning or fan was something like this. This is <laughs> how you cool off. Right. There weren't even electric fans to blow on you, it was just pretty much uh, hand fanning. Uh, this shows William Jennings Bryan arriving in Dayton, Tennessee with the pith helmet. He was the man that was chosen to prosecute teacher John Scopes. And Clarence Darrow was the man chosen to defend John Scopes, the, bio, the, the teacher, presumably biology teacher. Well, uh, here is William Jennings Bryan. We need to know something about the man. He was born in 1860, uh, died in 1925. In fact, he died five days after the Scopes trial. And he's famous for a number of things. He was considered probably America's greatest orator. Perhaps some would argue with that, but certainly he ranks among the best that we've ever had. And he was a popular Chautauqua speaker. These were people who, back before radio and television, traveled around the country speaking uh, in big tents and uh, in park stages and what have you. And people would come by the hundreds, even the thousands, and hear them. And of course, uh, no amplification system. So if you talk to uh, 2,000 people, you had to speak up. And speaking of speaking up, he was a very outspoken Christian. He was known all over the United States for his Christian convictions. Uh, this is perhaps unusual because he was a political leader for many years. He was the leader of the Democratic Party uh, for approximately 25 to 30 years. And during that time, he ran three times for president of the United States. 
uh, never succeeded in getting elected, but he was in there uh, running. He did serve as Secretary of State under President Woodrow Wilson. Here, by the way, is a sample of his voice. Uh, I in can a conceive of a national destiny which meets the responsibilities of today and measures up to the possibilities of tomorrow. Behold a republic resting securely upon the mountain of eternal truth. Well, that, that's fascinating. It gives us a frame of reference that we were able to record voices, that this is not ancient history. No, this is very early in recording uh, technique, and uh, you'll notice his voice isn't a booming voice. It's no. kind of a thin voice, but there was some quality to it that he could talk to several thousand people outside with no public address system, and he could be heard. While he served as Secretary of State, he played an important role in the popular election of senators. Uh, in the establishment of the federal income tax. He was involved in the unlimited coinage of silver. Uh, we were on a gold standard back then, and he proposed we make our coins out of silver so we could make more of them. And of course, then we abandoned silver and went to copper, and from there we went to paper. He was involved in the establishment of the Department of Labor, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, Workmen's Compensation, Minimum Wage, Women's Suffrage, Minority Rights, the Pure Food and Drug Act, and he was a bit of a pacifist. He tried to prevent the outbreak of World War I. He was basically against war in general. He would have been a liberal progressive in his day. For his day, this yes. was pretty progressive, right. and he never was elected. Now, once he got involved in the trial, uh, of course, uh, he uh, started to be portrayed in the media in a very different sort of way. He was popular in the media before the trial. Right. He was popular as a politician. In fact, Clarence Darrow, who was sort of the liberal's liberal, uh, supported his bid for the presidency in the first two runs. But once he started uh, prosecuting John Scopes for teaching evolution, then the media portrayed him rather differently. Uh, in the first picture you see on the left here, we see him portrayed as a crusader. And uh, the picture on the right is probably more typical of the time. This was from the Chicago Tribune. It shows Brian as Don Quixote, mm -hmm. who uh, is windmills. jousting with windmills of evolution. Right. In other words, right. feudal. Uh, futile effort, but my favorite that really captures the way the media still treats anyone today who dares to doubt Darwin is they portray him here as standing on a cliff. The cliff represents the Dark Ages. He's dumping a garbage can full of documents into the Dark Ages and uh, calling it all rubbish. So in other words, the suggestion is in this newspaper that anyone who dared to question the teachings of the Reverend Charles Darwin, whose only earned degree was in theology, such a person would be guilty of trashing all of science yes. is being trashed. This which was of the course, cutting edge studies of the day. That's which right. is so ridiculous it hardly bears comment. What about Clarence Darrow? He lived from 1857 uh, to 1938. As I mentioned, he was uh, easily America's most famous criminal lawyer. He was a very outspoken critic of Christianity, particularly what he called fundamentalism. He himself was uh, essentially an atheist, but he preferred the word agnostic, it sounded better. He was strongly opposed to the death penalty. He spent a lot of his time trying to keep people guilty of the most heinous sorts of crimes from getting the death penalty. He defended a lot of very unpopular people and radical causes, and probably his most famous case, apart from the Scopes trial, was the Leopold and Loeb case, where two young men killed a young boy, Bobby Franks, just basically for a thrill killing because they thought they could commit the perfect crime. And it wasn't quite perfect. They were caught just a few days later. But he did keep them from getting the death penalty. Well, how did the media portray Darrow? Dare I say they treated him much better than Bryant because he was defending evolution. The picture on the left is fairly typical. It shows Darrow uh, shaking his finger at Bryant, who's portrayed as a little boy. Yeah. And Darrow is telling Brian, there ain't no Sandy Claus. Wow. So in other words, uh, the naivete of, of yeah. Brian yeah. is that bad. The right is uh, another type of picture that you saw at the time that just kind of made a little fun of Darrow too. In this case, it showed a monkey in a tree looking down at Darrow saying, Papa. Well, that uh, brings us to the part one of the Scopes trial. I think you've done us, the church a great service with your research. You know, there's one thing that I want you to hold on to as a good origins viewer and never let go of, and it's simply this. It's God's view that He created you, and that should be your worldview too. Join us next time as we talk some more about the Scopes trial. We'll look for you then.
Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. If you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint information presented today, you can download a PDF file of program number 1002 from our website at www.originstv.org. Or for a DVD of this series, send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins, program number 1002, Cornerstone Television, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. Origins is made possible by the faithful prayers and the financial support of you, our Cornerstone Television family.